is the Seahawkers podcast, episode 385. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers, and joining me, my good buddy and Montana Seahawker, Adam Emmert. Yeah, man. Get to recap that uh, interesting Seahawks Atlanta. Oh, wait. Atlanta just picked up another first down on the ground. Uh, <laughs> football game that we watched this last Sunday. Core um, Daryl Patterson still running wild, even, still even running all wild. these days later. Yeah, yeah. The defensive poo-poo platter that we were served up on Sunday by the Seahawks. We get to chat about that. So that's exciting. And then uh, the idea that we might see the exact same thing this next week against the Detroit Lions. We could talk about that. Yeah. You know, going into the season, if there is one area where I expected to struggle, it was not on the defense. You know, in the preseason, we saw some pretty craptastic special teams. We saw some struggling offense, you know, not a whole lot of points, especially from the first team in the preseason. Right. And uh, yeah, and it turns out the defense, the worst of the three units so far, three weeks into the season. Yeah, and it's not even close, right? I mean, you can almost argue the offense is steadily progressing here and the defense is steadily regressing. It's not good. No. When is it going like, to get what fixed? was worse? The Niners game or this Falcons game for the defense? Oh, I definitely put it on the Falcons game. I, yeah, I mean, I guess the Niners got up quick enough to where I, I do feel like they coasted a little bit through the game. And instead they probably could have hung quite a few more points on the Seahawks defense. Like if they really tried, but maybe after yeah. watching Jimmy G play in Denver, it was probably a good thing that they, uh, that they coasted a little bit and didn't just yeah. try and, and lay on the points because yeah. Yeah. When they tried to score points against Denver, they struggled. Regress back to the mean with Jimmy a little bit there. And I mean, that's the thing with Jimmy, right? Like there's games where he looks really good. And then there's games that he looks really bad. Yeah. I mean, it's just the consistency is the difference in uh, a guy who washes out of the league. He doesn't even make a roster ever to a bad player to a, you know, just average player to a good player to a great player. It's the amount of consistency that is really the deal breaker because they're all very talented. Right. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing on this defense. Like they'll come up with a player or two here and there, but the consistency is just lackluster. It's not there. It's like you talked about after the game with Michael Jackson, at cornerback, you know, up, up, down, down, left, right. Yeah. Select start. I, I I wish we could you know do that and just get thirty extra guys on the field or something. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Mike makes a couple great plays, and then it's like three or four really bad ones all in a row. It, you know, panicking when the ball's in the air, or not getting his head around, or you know, just getting beat, whatever it is. And then he'll make a really great play. So it's it's hard to it's hard to know what you're going to get with him. Whereas the rookie somehow Woolen has been far more consistent. I, I've been happy about that part of it. Now we just have to find another guy who can be consistent opposite him, you know, whether or not maybe Sidney Jones could make his way back to the field anytime. Now, maybe Ryan Neal could make his way back to the field anytime. Now we've, I, I feel like I've seen enough Josh Jones to maybe work in a little bit of playing time for Ryan Neal, even though he, he played, uh, but only on special teams in that game yeah. against the Falcons 15, Special team snaps, no defensive snaps. I think we need to see some Ryan Neal. The, the competition's not over. And uh, as uh, even at the linebacker spots, I could see, I don't know who's going to challenge Cody Barton, but I, I feel like there's somebody that should. Um, right. I feel like Daryl Taylor is being challenged. So maybe if being off the ball and in that Cody Barton spot works a little bit better for him. The thing that I don't understand about Daryl Taylor in his struggles through the first three games of the season. Now, maybe it's kind of that because really last year was his rookie season. Maybe this is his sophomore slump after going through that. But this type of defense, I feel like suits more of what he did well in college at Tennessee because he was more of that three, four outside linebacker. You'd see him line up in the slot against receivers and, and out in coverage. And yeah, I, I I'm struggling to see why, he would have a harder time. Maybe it's just a size thing for him at the NFL level. 
Yeah, so let's uh, let's go through those three players real quick that you listed there: Jones, Barton, and Taylor. Yeah. Um, Josh Jones, I I think you're much lower on him than I am. I I think he's fine out there. I I don't think he's as big of a liability as people kind of put on. He did get beat for the touchdown. That was a nice jerk route that the receiver ran there. Like you're sometimes you're just gonna get got. Um, I I would almost be more angry at Quandre for just being MIA. Uh, with any sort of help from the safety position. He was just playing so far off the ball. Uh, and also, too, you're asking a safety to cover a, a slot receiver in space. I mean, that's kind of tough. A couple of the other receptions he gave up to Pitts, it's actually pretty good coverage. Just Pitts made a better play. Uh, so Josh Jones, to me, he's fine. I don't, I just like to see Ryan Neal out there uh, in the nickel spot a little bit more as that third safety. I think it would help him with, stopping the run as well, but I just, I've had enough of freaking Kobe Bryant. We can come back to that for a minute, but I've had enough of that dude. Yeah. He, he legit can't play, but then you th- talk about Barton and it's not just Barton. It's both inside linebackers. They are, they're flaming dumpster fire. They're a train of flaming dumpster fires when it comes to pass coverage right now. I, that third 19 was inexcusable by Brooks and, and Kobe inexcusable. Excusable. How do you not carry the receiver uh, any deeper on a third and catfish 19? Like that is, that is a joke. And Barton's no better. He's three or four steps behind seemingly on a lot of coverage plays and things like that. A little better in the run. I'm not going to bag on him too much there, but then again, that last Cordero touchdown, Barton just runs the wrong catfishing way into a block for no reason. For for no reason. Yeah, and hey, leaves that and fit. leaves that gap between the guard and the tackle wide ass open, and Cordero yeah. could take a full head of steam straight into the end zone from at least what was it, fifteen yards out. Exactly. And now we're mad at the safeties because you know they didn't make the play. It's like give me a break, yo. Oh, this was a Barton problem on, on that one. Uh, and then you talk about Taylor as being one of the technical outline or outside linebackers right now. Um, Yeah, he looks undersized to be playing in a 3-4. He really does. I mean, think about the guys who are very successful as a 3-4 end, right? Some of those more premier players. Right. They're, you know, the Bosa's and guys of that ilk. Like, they're bigger dudes. In some ways, this year, Kerry Hyder might have been a better player for this system than what we have now. I don't think Taylor matches up personnel-wise, especially in early downs, in this yeah, particular defense. Von, Von Miller isn't huge, though. No, but Von Miller's a special human being who plays football. Like, not everybody... I, yeah, well, he could just be he Von just Miller. Be Von okay, Miller. cool. How, can it, how come he can't just be Von Miller? Yeah, just be Von Miller, man. What's the, what's the issue here? You, you're, you're circling around it for sure. I, I, to me, the, the edge defenders are a joke right now. The idea that they're getting run on the way that they are is... Is just ridiculous. And it's not so much the interior guys. I mean, I feel like Al Woods, especially, is playing pretty well. Now, you're not seeing a lot of flash plays out of Puna. No. Uh, you did see Quentin Jefferson uh, bust in for a uh, tackle for loss, which was pretty cool. Um, or was it a sack? One of the two. But I guess they're both uh, a tackle for loss, so I covered my butt. <laughs> right. uh, he, did have a, he did have a sack on the day. Right, right. And the pass rush is just kind of hit or miss. But... Yeah, Nuosu and especially Taylor are just getting terrorized while they're trying to set the edge. And I think they're trying to get up field a little too much too consistently. So, yeah, it's it's unbelievably frustrating. It's not like they're playing great offensive teams either is the other part of it. It, it would Good be one teams. thing if they're playing the Bills and, I don't know, Miami right now. Um, they're just They've played... Atlanta and San Fran, which right. Yeah. They're fine. Offensively. Obviously the Broncos haven't been putting up a whole lot of points either. Ooh, they be broken right now. Uh, but yeah, the Falc or the, uh, the Falcons and the, uh, 49ers, they are both very good run teams. And so to get gashed by them, you're like, you just kind of hope to hold on and, and not just get, you know, ripped a new one. But it really didn't help that early in this game, Mariota came out on fire. 
Yeah. I mean, he was making all sorts of plays with accuracy. I have never seen out of him since his Oregon days. It was actually fairly impressive. It was interesting before the game kicked off. We had Matt DeShazo come in via the Facebook page before the game and said a very appropriate comment, as it turns out in hindsight, saying whoever runs the ball better today wins the game. Two teams that look about the same, trying to figure out what they have should be a good one. And yes, the Atlanta Falcons ran the ball better and got the win. Absolutely. And yeah, that was clairvoyant right there. But the Seahawks need to actually start to figure out how to run the football a little bit more because offensively, they put up numbers. Geno looked really good. But I think the next level to this offense is literally taking the ball out of Geno's hands and running it more. Uh, Penny looked good in the few touches that he had. Walker uh, we, had that we really Walker cool with that, that 20-yard run that, uh, where he's weaving in and out of traffic and dudes are running downfield, making blocks. Yeah, more Penny Walker, please. <laughs> more, more of those guys. Yeah, yeah, Aaron Levine out on Twitter pointed out the Seahawks gained 420 yards. They won time of possession. They were more than 50% on third down, and they won the turnover battle in this game. And with all those things, you would think, yeah, they should have won this game. Yep, but they did two things. They gave up a third and 19, which led to a scoring drive. And then they had their balls shrivel up late in the game and not go for it on a fourth and two after throwing a stupid fade on third that made zero sense. I, I mean, if you're going to run that play, you better be going for it on fourth. But you listen to Pete and like, oh, they just were out of whack out there. Well, you called a freaking timeout. How long does it take to get back in whack? <laughs> like, I, I think that you should be in whack by then. And be able to run a play. Yeah. What's the problem with not being able to run a play after you take a timeout? Like that's the point of taking the timeout, right? So you can get your guys together and yeah. just square things away is rewhack. Yeah. <laughs> rewhack it during the timeout. Right. See, they wanted to catch the defense off of whack or in whack. And then out of whack the, the, with the timeout, then the defense had a chance to also get back into whack. I think I'm, I've right. got these backwards, but yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're out of whack right now <laughs> is really what the problem is, but that it was really a, a frustrating call. Although I will say that I wasn't, I wasn't uber pissed about kicking the field goal there. I was like, well, I guess you can, but with the way that the defense hasn't stopped anything mm -hmm. for basically two games straight, I don't see putting the ball back in their hands and being like, all right, guys, go get that stop. Win us the game. On the other hand, though, it is Mariota on the other side. And he, like you said, he, he done. It could have been your mom. <laughs> he done pretty well throughout the day. And you're so I think you're as a coach, you're probably thinking Mariota has got to screw up sometime. Maybe now, now that we have the lead and the pressure is on him, now is the time where he makes one of those bad decisions and your defense is able to take advantage of it. And it all, it happened late in the game. Yeah. It just happened after they had the lead when he fumbled the football with Uchenna right in his face and he just decides to drop the ball on the ground. Yeah. Uh, well, that whole mesh point on the read option and all that, it can get dicey now and then and. Seems like the running back decided he wasn't going to let go. And uh, Mariota said he wasn't going to let go. And then the ground said it was hit theirs, you know? So, yeah, uh, that was cool, though. When that happened, I was like, hey, turn over. Here we go. Going to go back down the, the field here, like have a chance to win. And then Damian Lewis said no. And then it was all over. More penalties. Yeah. That, see, that was the other thing that they won all of those other elements that I know Pete Carroll likes to look at. They did not win penalties, which. When you factor in wins and losses, penalties, even having a disparity, unless it's drastic. Yeah. It doesn't generally factor into, you know, to, to how many wins and losses a team has. So I feel like Pete doesn't emphasize that as much. But right. when the penalties come in those really critical moments, yeah, they can they can definitely hurt you. Oh, yeah. And the penalty was, as Pete said, legit. It really was. And in real time, you're like, oh, okay, there it is. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> yeah. Can't be doing that. Especially when you're out in space like that, they're going to catch you every single time. And you can't put Gino in a 
whatever in 15 plus. You just can't. No. Uh, it's just, it's not going to work out. And I know a lot of people are mad that he threw the pick on fourth and 18. It's like, well, don't be in fourth and 18. <laughs> like you're asking, you're asking him to do something that he's not good at. And then they're like, I can't believe you didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> like what kind of sense does that make? You know, I don't understand a lot of the, the really big frustration, like people who are calling for drew lock. I, I don't understand that part of it. And it's not like, you know, you and I are saying that Gino has been this revelation and is the future of the team uh, mm-hmm. you know, that, that we wouldn't want to see a quarterback drafted. Although gosh, if he, if we were to put together uh, 16 games like these last three, uh, that would be pretty impressive. I, I don't know if he's going to do it, but again, I, I don't think that he's yeah. He, okay. He hasn't been Josh Allen, but he hasn't done anything that's worthy enough to take away his job. No, not even close. The problem has not been Gino to this point. It just hasn't been. I, you look at, well, just think about it in these terms. How much worse would this team be with Russ right now? <laughs> with the way he's come out of the gate. Can you even imagine? That would be a pretty miserable start. Yeah, it'd be really, really rough. Look, I, I think Gino has played with great rhythm. He's hitting all those um, rhythm throws and the intermediate stuff, especially the work with the tight ends has been excellent. He's not a check down Charlie. He's not going to be airing out, you know, sexy deep balls, but anything from that, like 20 yards and in is all stuff that he does pretty well. And the completion percentage is off of off the hook. He's something like 10th in the NFL in the, the ESPN silly QBR ranking, which I, I don't particularly care for, but I, it's pretty high. He's doing all the things. And then the thing that's not talked about much is I don't know if you've noticed his command at the line of scrimmage, getting in and out of plays. You can tell like reading the, the safeties and all the things that the defense are doing and trying to adjust and he having the answers for that and getting him into, uh, if not a good play, at least not a bad play. And I think he's done a very good job of that. His risk management has been pretty good. Although he did have another throw in this game that should have been a pick to the linebacker Walker. Yeah. Uh, but overall Gino's played better than I would hope. He's Alex Smith. He's Alex Smith right now, like chiefs, Alex Smith. And that's pretty good. Yeah. It's not, it's not great. It's pretty good. It's been pretty good. I I feel like making a move to Drew would one be a downgrade at the moment and one send the wrong message to the team. Like right. what kind of message are you sending? Like Gino hasn't played that poorly. He's taken care of the football. He's distributed the football well. Mm-hmm. We see the the ball going to the tight ends. You, you see Tyler and DK get a pretty good mix of catches. Would we like to see DK get more sure, but you know, that I feel like the defense is probably focusing on him being the guy that he is. And yeah, I, I really, the one problem that I feel like we've touched on a little bit already, but here's Chris Farnsworth out on Twitter, who is also saying it says my biggest head scratcher was our game plan. We threw the ball two times to one while averaging five yards per carry on the ground. Penny and Walker were eating the ground game up. We didn't let Russ throw the ball 40 times until his fourth or fifth season on purpose. Yeah. I mean, Gino is also in his whatever season this is. What is it? 12th or 14th or whatever. Uh, But with that said, yeah, I I think that I saw today, like the T uh, the Seahawks are in like the top five passing teams this year or something along (laughs) those lines. It's like, wait a second. That's not how it's supposed to go. This is not how it was supposed to go at all. No, and they you know, honestly, Waldron, I think, fell in love with the quick pass game there a little too much in the Falcons game. And I think they'll get it addressed. I think they'll get those 15 ish touches for Penny going here. And the Lions are a great team to do it again. So it'll be fun to see that. Uh, I did want to get to some of the other rookie watch stuff. Like, I mean, the tackles. I mean, can you really ask for anything more out of the out of the rookie tackles? They're better than the interior linemen. Yeah. And they're the rookies. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, I'm just thrilled. I am thrilled with cross and Lucas, uh, you know, put a star on their chest. I'm sure there's lots of stuff that they can learn and get better at and all that stuff. But those guys, they, they've earned a cookie. These, these first three weeks, I'm, I'm really excited about what they're doing on the day 
Abraham Lucas allowed two pressures, which did result in quarterback hits, uh, but just two pressures on the day. Charles Cross gave up three. One was a sack, uh, and the other two were quarterback hurries. But then you look at Gabe Jackson. Gabe Jackson is having a rough time this year, and he's the most yeah. senior guy on the offensive line. He gave up four pressures. Uh, Blythe gave up two. Um, he didn't look great. There's the Austin Blythe that I expected uh, coming into the season. He gave, he gave up that one sack where he just got killed on the stunt. There's yeah. no doubt about it. And then yeah. the run game, I didn't think that he he blocked all that well. How many whips do you use? How many different whips do you use when you're whipping Austin Blythe? He's your whipping boy, man. Like you, you, I, held you off. Uh, I had to you, the last couple of games. He hasn't been that bad. And then, so now right. when I have the opportunity, he's yeah. got to take it. Yeah, I guess so. He had a tough matchup in this game going up against Grady Jarrett and yeah, Jarrett. I mean, probably had, he didn't have a great game, but I mean, he had enough to where you noticed him. He had the one big sack towards the end of the game. That was really a difference maker. I think that is the one that uh, Blythe uh, gave up he as did, well, yeah. but so yeah, tackles playing well. And then we got to talk about Woolen and his pick. Now I, I know it was at the end of the half and it didn't matter and any of that, but that was, that was a great pick. Got, you know, broke the ice. He yep. was not exposed uh, throughout the entire game, held his own, no penalties. And honestly, I think he could have scored on that pick. If for Kobe Bryant, pulling his head straight out of his Catfish. ass and making a block. Willem makes the pick. Kobe looks at him and starts running down the field. First guy coming for Willem that he's just trying to get around. Willem's expecting Kobe to block him. Kobe looks at him and just runs straight by him <laughs> down to another guy that he runs straight by. He was just running. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he can't play football. He didn't have his greatest moments. I mean, Ken Walker didn't have. Uh, some, I mean, we had the one exciting moment, at least from from Walker. But then we also had the moment where was it second down or third down when he just decided to run the opposite direction of the play. And then Gino just had to essentially eat the uh, yeah. the ball as, yeah. as as then Walker realized that he wasn't getting the ball. And then he ran up to maybe try and block, but then not block. And yeah, yeah. Gino just got swallowed up. Yep, that was a little bit of a disaster. It, and it's going to happen. And that's one of the things with this team too, is there is so much change and there are so many new faces that there's going to be a lot of growing pains. And you hear Pete talk about it. And then he, he says, yeah, we got to learn. We got to do all this stuff. And he's like, but there's no time. It's got to happen right now. And it's like, hey, that's not how this is working. Like it's going to take time. It, that's just what it is. I think as a coach, you have to understand that this isn't, I, it's a tough thing to balance, right? Because on one hand, you want to send the message to the vets and the and keep, continue that always compete mentality of we have to win right now. We want to win, but also recognizing you have a lot of young players on the team that need to get up to speed and they're your future. So the more action that you can give them now, the 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 better that's going to pay off in the future, too. So. Right. Yeah, uh, and and Pete did confirm that yes, uh, Walker did run the wrong direction on that particular play. Um, I I hope, and but he did sound like he's, I don't know, we we've we've seen him say uh, really glowing things about Walker to where I think we'll see more of him on the field. Oh, for sure, uh, both him and Penny, uh, they'll get through those rookie mistakes. It is part of the game. Uh, I do like, I mean, you'd mentioned the idea of Metcalf getting a little bit more action. I actually really like the way that Gino is spreading the ball around. There is nobody you can lock onto and just be like, ah, oh, shut him down. We're good. He's getting the ball to everybody. Even Penny Hart in this game had a catch. Yeah. How about that? Penny Hart getting catches. I, I like the distribution to the tight ends. We talked about that already. I mean, shoot. Yeah. Colby Parkinson's catching passes. And we yeah. weren't sure about it him that much coming into the season. Yeah. Now, look, the only guy that uh, I think didn't get a catch out of all the potential pass catchers was D Eskridge. Like, he was out there blocking a lot. Good. Cool. That's exactly why we spent a second rounder on the guy. Yeah. Be a hell of a blocker. One of the smallest dudes on the team blocking. Yeah. 
I'm surprised he hasn't put it together more with his skill set. I, I really, I, I'm stunned by that one. I, I think there might be a little bit of a trust issue. They're, they're trying to work through that a bit more. Yeah. We'll see. I'm still hopeful. I'm not giving up on Eskridge yet, but it's not He's looking getting, good. We're, we're starting to get closer to the busty end of things. We are. Yeah. In, in this season, he, he needs to figure it out. And when Goodwin comes on and is catching those types of, and, and is being involved the one. in the volume that you would hope that Eskridge would be at this point in his career. Not a good look. Not a good look. All right. Anything else you want to hit on with this game against the Atlanta Falcons? It sucks to lose that one, man. Like that felt totally winnable. And with the way the offense was playing, I just, I felt like we were going to win it. And I just, I'm a little bummed, man. If that penalty doesn't happen and they are down inside the 10 yard line on that final drive, I mean, just think of how much different we feel with Gino leading a fourth quarter comeback after being down by what is it? It was 20, yeah, 27, 23. Cause that was the final score after being yeah. down by four. If he were to lead a comeback, win 30 to 27, it would be a lot different feeling two and one leading the division, you know, yeah. watching San Francisco play terrible, watching the Rams be so, so relatively yeah. Arizona Cardinals kind of stinking. I feel pretty good about, I mean, I still feel pretty good about our team in comparison to some of the other NFC West teams, especially the cards, especially the cards. Yeah. I feel a lot better about this team than I do. The Cardinals. Now they, they need to get the red zone stuff figured out on offense. It's just, it's just not working. And for that matter on defense too, because they're bending, breaking, uh, they're doing everything. Like, I mean, if they could either stop the run or the pass, this defense could be good. Pick one. Just pick one. It, or any of them. Yeah, uh, yeah. you could do both. People do it you all could, the time. You could do both, but I would be satisfied starting with one. I would pick the run then. Uh, that would be my preference. Do you see this run defense uh, changing at all going into this uh, Detroit game? I, I'm Is not it home sure. or away? Must be away, yeah? It is away in Detroit. Yeah, yeah, where we tend to have some success, but well, it turns out Detroit's a uh, top five running team. So take that for what it's worth. That Jamal Williams kid looks pretty good. Swift is pretty good. Yeah, it, it could be another struggle fest on defense this week. I, I really think it it could be. It it could be. It uh, you know what? Before we get to it though, crack them open my can of liquid death. I would have, but I already drank them all. They were that good. <laughs> you, I've, you, I've burned. I've burned through like two and a half cases of this the, stuff. I gave a, away quite a few. Oh yeah. I was gonna say they sent you all of the product. That was that was for you too. And you went through it. Oops. I thought that was just for me. I had no idea. Yeah. It was. It was that good. And then when we had friends up this last weekend, like it got. That was one of the go tos. People were grabbing those left and right. Man. You know what you should do though. I, yeah. I wish that I had the opportunity for this. Working from home. I, it, it doesn't give me quite the same opportunity, although I could do it on a uh, a virtual meeting where I'm on camera. Yeah. But when you're at the job, when mm -hmm. you at your next job at the mill, bring yeah. one of these and just crack it open right uh, as you're getting ready to go to work there. Uh, I'm going to need it, man. This weekend, it's down in Louisiana. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be hot. It's always hot. doesn't matter if it's uh, middle of winter or not. I'll be sweating. I'm going to have crazy thirst. And so, yeah, man, I'm going to have to find me some liquid death down in Louisiana. Crack one open, take a chug right around the safety folks and just just to see their reaction. It's it may look like beer, yeah. but it's totally water. Yeah, it's always fun to screw with the safety guys, man. You can go get liquid death at your local Albertsons, Fred Meyer, Target or Chevron Extra Mile or find a liquid death retailer near you with their store locator tool. You can go to liquiddeath.com forward slash Hawkra. That's liquiddeath.com slash H-A-W-K-R-A. All right. Let's talk more about this, this matchup with the Lions. Mm -hmm. We talked about the running game. And yes, the Detroit Lions are a running team. Now, DeAndre Swift is a little bit hobbled with an ankle injury. That could be beneficial. 
But they got Jamal Williams, who is kind of more of the power style back, which I don't think it makes it any better, really. It could be anybody. We just saw a wide receiver run all over us. <laughs> exactly. And Jamal Williams has enough shiftiness to him. I like I like him as a back. I, I've watched a bit of him, and I was like, okay, that guy can play. Like he's you might good. just you, you may just not have those breakaway style runs like you would have like like you'd have to worry about with Swift. Uh, sure. I, again, I I would worry about anybody with breakaway runs against this run defense right now. Well, yeah, because you can't even count on. I mean, Quandre Diggs had two missed tackles in this last game, so it's not like yeah. even on the back end you can say, well, at least you got. Quandre and you know Josh Jones back there to clean things up. It's not working out that great either. No, Quandre hasn't looked great, especially in the run game early on in this season. And uh, I don't know if he's still working his way back from you know the big leg injury at the end of last year, or you know if it is really affecting his play not having Jamal Adams out there. Uh, and he's Bobby having Wagner, a, not having Bobby Wagner out there. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, that's a that's a problem. Mm -hmm. It's showing up as a problem, no doubt about it. Because Brooks is having a hard time taking on all those duties, and I think that's why. I mean, while he, well, I mean, in coverage, yeah, he's just been terrible. But as you say, although he hasn't been terrible, he's, yeah, in coverage, he's been terrible. Yeah. He, he hasn't been able to pick up those duties and the play calling duties. And like, I could see Goff, you know, hit, targeting the linebackers all day. That's kind of his bread and butter, right? those intermediate crossers or they run everybody off and then they run the drag route underneath everything that the linebackers are supposed to pick up. Yeah. It, it could, it could be another disaster against Jared freaking golf. I think that with the way that the pass rush has been, I would rather just rush three against golf and drop dudes back into coverage and try and keep everything in front of you and and not allow those big plays you know hopefully that would help them focus on the run too so that way they're not you know like we've seen with the the guys defending the edge i, I think they just get upfield too fast that those that those gaps uh are are so large for yeah. the the running backs to run through i want to see some incremental improvement like i know they're probably still going to be yeah uh struggling even against this lions team but I want to see improve enough improvement to where I, I feel good about some of the dudes that we have on defense. Yeah. And the corners are going to be tested again this week. I mean, St. Brown's a legit player. He, he's very good. He's sneaky. And then DJ Chark is, I, I would say he's a pretty good receiver. Not, a, not amazing, but pretty good. Right. Yeah. And they got uh, the former Ram, uh, Josh Reynolds. Yep. And, you know, he contributes every now and then too. And I, they're going to be, you know, tough to, tough to stop. So we'll see if the, the secondary can step up here too, but you, you said incremental change. And I, I would at least accept that if we could get it. Um, I know somebody had written in the comments on one of our la last episodes that, you know, just remember the offense looked like trash against the Niners and they came out and looked really good against the Falcons. So there can be drastic change. The only thing is, is that, when I watched the offense against the Niners, it didn't look like they were a totally broken unit that just couldn't figure it out. Right. Yeah. Just had some mistakes, a couple of mistakes and they'd move the ball though. And they didn't have many three and outs. And uh, there was, there were things to hang your hat on uh, this defense, the way that they've been playing, the way they've been trending. I, I just, I don't see that. I, I see a broken unit and it's not much better for the lions defensively either. There's this a, is the defense optional bowl, man. It like, is. This could be this could be a shootout, a Geno Smith, Jared Goff shootout. Well, we saw against the Falcons, the offense was able to work very well because Geno wasn't under a ton of pressure. Now, Grady Jarrett got in the backfield a few times, and I think it might have even been Jarrett that got through the line on that fade route to DK that uh, that helped disrupt that. Maybe maybe Geno threw it a little bit sooner than he wanted to. Uh, with that that route to DK, but the Lions have not been able to generate pressure, even with Aiden Hutchinson, the number two overall pick from the draft. So right. they haven't been super happy with him, and yeah, it's been it's been kind of a struggle for them. Now they have uh, a, a pretty solid corner in Jeff Akuda. Although I don't know if you heard DK's press conference. No, not yet. 
<laughs> they they asked him about Akuda, and he's like, "Well, he's got help over the top for the safety." So TK no, okay. wasn't too wasn't wasn't super impressed. I think with Akuda's performance because then they they tried to get him to go a little bit deeper, and he's like, "Watch the tape." Interesting. Okay, DK lack of respect for the Akuda. Yep. I, I think DK could have a, a big game. Tyler's been so consistent throughout this year so far. It's been really fun to watch and just doing Tyler things, you know, finding those little voids in the zone and then catching the ball and getting down. Now, one thing that the Seahawks really do need to work at, man, is some yard after the catch stuff. Like it's really frustrating to watch, like going back and watching the Falcons game, getting screened to death and then still not be able to run a screen. Like, how is it that all the plays of, uh, you know, yards after contact yards after the catch, all those schemed up easy peasy things. Like we just can't do it or Tyler or DK not making people miss after catching the ball. And you know, this isn't, he, he's not shaking anybody out of their boots. No. Uh, you know, you expect a little more out of Noah Fant, but he's only getting so many touches. Parkinson's kind of straight line fast, but yeah, just not a lot of yards after the catch, man. And that's, that'd be something that could help this offense out a ton. Well, with Tyler, I, I don't expect it just because one, it's generally the routes that he runs and, you know, finding because he's so good at finding the spaces in the zone. That's not necessarily those timing type plays that are going to Tyler. And also, I mean, you worry about him being able to, to yeah. sustain uh, his health with some of the hits. Cause I mean, we saw him take that hit where it uh, busted up his shoulder, I guess, where he had to go to the tent. Um, yeah. And yeah, you don't want, you don't want those hits on Tyler. Hey, uh, he's been playing receiver like a quarterback, you know, just get down yeah. get, when, when you're out. In open space. I, I want Tyler for it. all 17 games. I, I'm fine with it. That's protecting the team. I think that's very smart. Um, I, I just, I can't believe DK hasn't been able to rip off some bigger, you know, after the catch kind of things. He just, just hasn't been there. Yeah. They can find a way to, well, I, I feel like some of the plays have been there. It's just maybe the, the timing. Well, they've had some timing throws to DK where it's yeah. just, yeah, I think the defense is so focused on DK that, that generally the yards after the catch aren't there. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is something that you worry about though with the lions and the thing that's going to affect them though, this week, it looks like is injuries. I mean, Amon Ross St. Brown also has an ankle injury and was oh. out of practice on Wednesday. Deandre Swift, who we already mentioned, has an ankle and a shoulder injury. He was out of practice. Josh Reynolds was out of practice on Wednesday with an ankle injury. Um, TJ Hawkinson, their tight end. He had a hip injury last week and a foot injury that kept him out of practice this week. So oh, shoot. that's a lot of their pass catchers that are banged up right now. Yeah. No, I didn't realize that the injury bug had kind of hit him so bad here in the last week or two. Uh, they do play hard for Dan, uh, Dan Campbell though. And I mean, Dan Campbell had a fourth down meltdown late in the game against the Vikings. You know, I he was mean, that, going for it on fourth down all day long. Right. But I did see that the previous fourth down, they did not make it on a, on like a stretch play. And so hmm. maybe that went into the thinking it was a fourth and one. But that was a bad beat to the to the Vikes. I, I I thought they had that one. Yeah. Lions fans, not super happy about it. Glover Quinn, who I talked to for an interview, yeah. he was he was not real happy, especially with the decision to not go for it late in the game. Oh, was he was he not a fan? No. He he definitely wanted as well, as a defensive player, I think that for one, it was such a long field goal. Yeah, I think as as a defensive player, he wanted that extra space that if uh, they went for it and failed, then at least, you know, you would hope that they would gain a couple of yards is right. one of the things that he said. And yeah, that uh, that they didn't get it. He just he just thought that it gave the team a better opportunity to win going for it in that situation. Yeah, I'll be interested to hear the the rest of the interview. I mean, that was a really cool get by you and. Uh, just really neat. It sounds like he, you know, had a, a lot of time to spend with you and 
I, like I said, I, I have uh, high hopes that that was a, a good interview overall. Plus, you're the Charlie Rose of Seattle Seahawks football when it comes to interviews. You're an amazing interviewer. So I'm sure it's fantastic. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll probably put that out because it is a half hour long interview. I'll probably put it out separately, but it'll be another okay. another way into this preview Um as we match up against the lions, you know, we have the, the what if show coming up, we have the prop stars, which looks at it a little bit different angle. And now this week we'll have a player interview that uh, to talk about how the lions have been doing this week. So yeah, don't yeah. miss the interview with former lion safety Glover Quinn. That'll be coming up on the stream as well this week. Uh, I'm going to miss out on prop stars this week. And uh, it's because I am going to be traveling, but honestly, it, it's probably a little bit of ducking because uh uh, it hasn't been good for me so far. Uh, this this team not playing like this team has really hurt my bets. You've gotten one. Have I now? I think, so you, I guess I the think first you got week, one right the first week. Yeah, the Geno interception thing. Yeah. No, it, it's been a dumpster fire ever since. So, Any big predictions for this game coming up against the Lions that then listeners can turn around and bet the opposite of what you think is going to happen? Oh, but you can't bet the opposite of this one because you can't bet or <laughs> root or pick against the Seahawks and pick them because I think the Seahawks win this game 48 to 45. <laughs> and I think Jared Goff has a goof towards the end of the game and Gino remains solid. It, it's going to come down to whether or not they can carry the lead, you know, whether they can get the lead and carry it into the fourth quarter. Cause I, I still, I don't have the confidence that they can do the, the comeback thing at the end. But I think if they take the lead, a significant lead, like maybe the defense makes a play in the fourth quarter, they're able to get up 10 points and then kind of coast out through the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. That, that's the way that I see the team winning this game. And I, I think they're going to get it. I, I think that the Seahawks will get this win against the Lions. It's, it's in range. I mean, it's a, it's a winnable game. And I just think that, you know, even if they are down and they're having to come back, as long as you stay on schedule, I I think this offense can Mm -hmm. make that comeback attempt, but you do give up a a big sack or, you know, the big penalty as they did this last week. And you put Gino in not a very manageable down and distance uh, that that's when I think they'd have the biggest struggles right there. And I know there's people probably out there listening to us saying, you know, have you guys even watched some of the Lions? They they played the Vikings, who are a really good team. They played the Eagles, that are the really yeah. that are a really good team, and then they beat the Commanders. So they've played two really good teams, tough, and they've beat the team that they're supposed to beat. Don't you think that they're probably going to be able to walk all over the Seahawks? And I I, I don't think so. I think with the Lions' defense, it uh, makes it so that the, the that Seattle can be competitive in this game. Absolutely. I mean, this defensive craptastic bowl is, uh, is going to make it so that it's a shootout and it's going to be entertaining. If you're into that kind of football, there's no doubt about it. And I'm not saying that the lions are a bad team because to lion fan point, like, yeah, they beat the commanders. They pay, they play too good. I don't know exactly how good the Vikings are. I don't know exactly how good the Eagles are, but yeah. And also too, I mean, that was the anti clutch bowl right there between cousins and golf and just so happened that, uh, you know, cousins managed to come out on top on that one probably Cause it wasn't Monday night, but, uh, yeah, it, they're a fine team. They play hard. They're not the dumpster fire lions that we, we knew five years ago or whatever. Uh, Dan Campbell's got them playing hard and they're going in the right direction. But I think that this is actually a fairly even matchup when it's all said and done. Well, we're going to find out just how. Even this matchup is coming up on Sunday. And the good news is, much like last week, win or lose, we still win. Exactly. Let's get to the second half of the show. All right. Win or lose, we still win. Does that mean we lost double last week? Yes. Yeah. Catfish. King Niners. God, you can't do anything right, man. The game was on a platter for those guys. They were right there. Uh, 
But Jimmy so has to go and step out of the back of the end zone. Although maybe it was a good thing that he stepped out of the back of the end zone because the, you know then yeah the rare taking a safety being a good thing. Uh, yeah, because it saved him from it, the disastrous pick six. Yeah, but it was hilarious though to watch the whole game. I mean, even though the Niners lost and so it didn't help us draft wise, like just watching that game was high comedy. This watching both the struggle fest that was on the field. You know, really, as far as the outcome goes, it probably was the best. I mean, just in terms of Seahawks fans enjoyment, because you saw Russ not playing well. So there is that hope that, again, you don't root for the guy to do terribly, but you root for the better draft pick. And yeah. you kind of you, you see some of those issues that we saw in Seattle showing up. Um, and it was so it wasn't just a Pete Carroll thing. Yeah. Um, the hilarious part is just the the national media being like, well, Russ, he's just he's just not running. Like, when are we going to see the real what Russell Wilson again? And like all those little flaws that we've seen, everybody's just kind of starting to catch on to. Uh, they they are late to the game though. And then for the Niners, you yeah. saw them. Well, I mean, we even hyped up the Niners a little bit after last week, saying that they improved because Lance was yeah. You know, they didn't have to deal with having Trey Lance try and get up to speed during the season when they have a, a relatively well put together team. But then we saw bad Jimmy and yeah. So that he reared his ugly face uh, for the Niners. His and, handsome and ugly then, face. Yeah, yeah. So you had Niners fans going nuts because there's a, the segment of them that are like, this. see, this is the reason why we wanted to get rid of Jimmy and move on to Trey. Right. And the funny part is, even after that game, they still got better with Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. That's how poor Trey is, at least at this point. At this point, right. So. Yeah, we got yeah. A, a little bit of Schadenfreude on on both sides of the football. Yeah, for sure. And look, every uh, offensive possession that the Broncos struggle is just magic for me because I get the frustrated texts from Bronco Jared uh, that that are so much fun, and <laughs> those are super enjoyable. So, hats off to Nathaniel Hackett. Thanks for making my life better. He's gonna take all the blame for it, though. Just why? I know. I, oh, he already is. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's laid it on Russ's feet yet. Not at all. No. And I don't think they he will. has the one drop. I think he can. I think he can skate through based on how some of those coaching decisions were made and, and some of the clock management type issues. I think that Russ will be able to skate for the most part until we see it happen with yet another coach. Probably. And I think I think it's going to get better for Russ here for at least a few weeks. I mean, it can't be a, a totally dumpster fire season, can it? I don't know. The Let's Ride curse is strong, buddy. <laughs> what else do we have from week three as we watched? We watched the Cardinals lose to the Rams 12 to 20. So that was the other divisional games. Both teams facing off against each other. Yeah. And cards looking just terrible. Terrible. Their only win is a lucky ass victory against the the Raiders, who ha, have also not looked great. Who do we got coming up this week, though? Or or should we? Okay, we're gonna get into pick'em this week. Okay. Did you make your picks last week? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I I have a question whether or not, and this one could go out to everyone listening too. Okay. Are you enjoying Adam's terrible after the fact picks segment? Like, should we keep bad that going? Week and they're terrible. Like they, they're not that bad. Adams after the fact picks. I'll accept that. But the adjective terrible, like that's over the line. All right. Are people enjoying Adams? Not terrible. Lazy ass late picks <laughs> segment that now that that I could accept because that's the truth. I got to thinking of it after after we did it last week. I was like, well, shoot, we should have just gone ahead and picked the next week's games. Rather yeah. than go through them after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's what we do. Maybe, uh, maybe we get ahead of this thing. One of these weeks, but I, I do wonder if it's more entertaining if you're making your picks after the fact, and maybe, still, I don't know. And still yeah. not showing up at the top of the leaderboard. Nobody's calling me a cheater yet. So I, I think they know that I'm being honest about it. All right. 
Well, coming up this week in the NFC, Cardinals going on the road against the Panthers. We got mm-hmm. Broncos going up against the 0 and 3 Raiders. Oh, that would be a, a let's ride curse moment if the Raiders able to pull out of their first victory of the season against Russ. Oh, well, I mean, it'll be Chandler Jones's first good game of the year. Well, it yeah, he's due for it. One, because yeah. it's Russ. And exactly. It's just Chandler's game. It's just it's how how the Chandler do. Well, we are treated to just like last week where we had the primetime matchup. I don't know if I'd say if treated is the right word, but we had the opportunity to watch the Niners and Broncos in primetime. Yeah. And we're going to have the Rams and Niners in primetime this week. Mm, yeah. Monday night. <sighs> oh, it's Monday night. Yeah. Uh, boy, might be. I, I think I'm flying. Tough break. Not going to be able to watch. Oh, maybe you'll be able to have it in the in the in your seat on the screen. No, no, no? I don't. I don't think. I don't think they would do that. I, that that just be you know torturing the passengers for however far it is from Dallas to Missoula. Well, I think generally you get to change the channel on your own TV on the airplane. Yeah, it's true, and a lot of people choose Yellowstone. They just do. It's on all the screens. Yeah. Especially when you're flying to Montana, right? No, this was a like Dallas to what the last time that I saw this da- Dallas to Chattanooga. Oh, and everybody's just watching Yellowstone. Yeah. Am I missing out on this show? No, it's a dumpster fire. It sucks balls. I'm still working my way through Supernatural. I'm on season 14. Okay. All right. Uh, we're doing uh, reservation dogs right now. A reservation or reservoir? reservation dogs. No reservation dogs. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's about, uh, you know, some kids that are growing up on, uh, the res in uh, oh, Oklahoma. Okay. And, uh, I mean, it might as well, it could, might, it could be Browning. It could be uh crow agency. Yeah. You know what I mean? It could be any of the, it could be Polson. Sure. It's, oh. it's really well done. And the actors are outstanding. And, uh, it, it I, I've enjoyed that guy. Cause I think I saw a preview that they're going to be doing like a reservoir dogs style show now. Oh, are they? So oh. they had a call back to the movie, to the movie. Yeah. I was confused when I was recommended this, uh, the first time as well. I was like, yeah, I've already seen that. And they're like, no, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> but we want to thank some of our members of the flock this week who went to get in the flock.com subscribe to the show if you want to go and become a member of the flock, get in the flock.com $3 and above gets you into our discord chat where we are on game day. And I'm going to be sending out some stuff here shortly for those of you who came in and it, it's backed up long enough that I need to send out mail to everybody who's gotten to the flock and deserves some stickers or patches or anything else. Heck yeah, man. That's awesome. I, I appreciate you getting after that. Maybe after I quit my job, I'll, I'll be able to, you can take that over. Uh, I, well, I can help. No, you can take it over. I can help. We've got some big help from our executive producers, DCH, Dustin Mock, Brian Shaw, and Rebecca Christensen. And we've also got our new members of the flock, starting with Carlos Fuentes, who came in at $3 a month. Welcome to the flock to Carlos. Yeah, what up, Carlos? He's getting a stinking patch. Uh, $5 is for the patches. $5 so the patch. oh, $3 okay. get you some stickers. Hey, that gives, uh, that gives Carlos some, uh, uh, incentive. If he ever decides to give us a raise down the road, but I, I'm fired up for the $3. Cause now he can compete with my after the fact pick'em league stuff. There you go. Yeah. Also competing in the pick'em league and welcome to join our Facebook group ring of honor. 12, 12 from Ranger Luke. RGR Luke says, you guys rock. The Miles Adams interview was the moment I realized I could no longer be a freeloader. Not when you're bringing us this type of content gold every week. I appreciate you all. Go Hawks. Hey, go Hawks, man. And uh, yeah, we're going to keep it rolling. You know, like I said, Brandon, he just did the the interview here with uh, Glover Quinn. Very cool. So we used to do a lot of that stuff. But, you know, when we were just kind of hobbying this, it was just like, eh. It's a lot of work, you know, making all the calls and, and getting the scheduling and all that stuff. So, uh, but yeah, since we're cranking it up. Heck yeah. I, I appreciate you guys uh, reciprocating the value for value here. 
Also coming in with some value via whatever app you use. I, I, I have it set up to where you want to send in a boost with Bitcoin or Satoshis. You can do yeah. that. And I, we must have one listener because they're back in with and this is a good way to do it anonymously, too. If you just if you yeah. if you want to be anonymous, but support the show. We got 11,893 Satoshis coming in. So thank you to Anonymous Satoshi Donor for giving us a little boost via the app. Dude, there's nothing like being a Shitoki multi-thousandaire. <laughs> and maybe you just want to hear Adam try and pronounce Satoshi. That's uh, it's, 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 it's fun every time. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the Pick'em League. The winner this past week with 10 picks correct, Rip Dazzled Adam. <laughs> Love it. We also had, well, there were seven teams, seven, eight, seven teams that came in with 10 correct picks. Uh, Jeremy Miner got 10, Lord of the Hawks, 10. Oh. Uh, still Dange Russ, show me your TDs. I miss Carl Lester. <laughs> <laughs> Show me your TDs. It's funny. Yeah. Uh, I miss Carl Lester Crumpler. There's a throwback. Yeah. And peaceful, easily feeling. There's a, a recognizable. Yes. Gary's cheating again. Wait, you know, it takes him a new and exciting way every year uh, to get it done. And I, I think he's starting to figure out his cheat code for this year. Because Gary is leading the Pick'em League once again with 29 points. Hey, but no look way. at me. Look at me. I'm at 28. One behind the lead. Gavin Richie. Reyes, 28 points. MK, decaf. And suck for luck. In the How many five. do I need to get right to get in the mix here this week? Um, let's Before see. you ask me what my picks were. <laughs> <laughs> to get in the mix. Well, you would be... You, you got to get 10 right to get into the... Okay. The top spot. All right. But I'd say I'd say eight was probably a, a pretty good average for folks this past week. Okay. So can you do it? Uh, <laughs> knowing what your goal is supposed to be, <laughs> but also being yeah. honest with yourself. Yeah. Here are Adam's terrible after the fact week three picks. Okay. Here we go. Still not terrible. So <laughs> screw you. Pittsburgh at Cleveland, Thursday night game. I'd have chose Cleveland. Baltimore at New England. I'd have chose Baltimore. Buffalo at Miami. I would have chosen Buffalo. Yes. Cincy at New York. I would have chose Cincy. Detroit at Minnesota. This is the one that after the fact, like asking myself, like, what would I have done? Because after week one, I like the Vikes quite a bit. And I, I do respect the Lions the way they're playing. I think the Vikings didn't have a good showing week two. So I think I probably would have gone to trade. All right. Houston at Chicago. <sighs> I'd have gone Houston. I don't even know who won that game. <laughs> Chicago won that game. Oh, okay. But it, but it was close. All right. Uh, I think I think Houston should have won. Kansas City at Indianapolis. I would have definitely taken Kansas City. Did not see that win by Indy coming at all. Vegas and Tennessee. I would have had Tennessee. Dude, you know you have to get to 10, and you're already picking crappily. I, I told you I'm going to be honest <laughs> about it. New Orleans at Carolina. New Orleans. Philly at Washington. Philly. Jacksonville against the Chargers. Was Herbert playing last week? I think he did play. I think he ended up playing. I'd have taken I'd have taken LA. Atlanta, Seattle, you would have taken Seattle. Mm -hmm. Green Bay and Tampa. It was in Green Bay, right? No, it was in Tampa. I'd have taken Tampa. Rams and Arizona. Rams. San Fran and Denver? San Fran. Dallas and the Giants. Cooper Rush. I would have taken Dimes. the Giants. I, I, I would have taken the Giants. I would have been drinking the blue Kool-Aid a little bit. All right. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> now I have to go back to the standings because I, I, I don't recall which teams won, but. Yeah. 
I don't. How think, bad was that? I don't think he did very well. I mean, out of those picks, though, like which ones that make no sense? What I said him again. You're you're very good about being honest about you know how you would have analyzed the games going into that particular week. Yeah. And uh, you you ended up with six picks correct. Stay tuned for next week's Adam's terrible post game post week picks. Uh, if you guys uh, so like this sort of thing, let us know. Three weeks into the season, yeah, picking after the fact, and you are eight picks back of the lead. Okay. For the record, week one, I picked my catfish ahead of time. Did you? I did. Except for the opener, I think. Oh, I that's that right. One. Oh, that, I I think yeah, we went through the first. I think we went through the morning games. Oh, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, I got half the week in week one. All right. Yeah. Yes. Do I need to set an alarm on my phone to, to get this done, or should I just keep rolling with this? Just, just uh, keep doing them after the fact. Okay. All right. Fair enough. We'll see. I I did I, I did a small focus group of people, well, especially in our Ring of Honor on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. And they seem to enjoy the after the fact picks more. <laughs> hey, maybe I found a, a new niche here. Maybe. You yeah. do, this might be... A reverse like, Nostradamus. We could do an entire national show based on this. Yeah, absolutely. There we go. Start a whole industry mm -hmm. of after the fact picking. We could do after the fact bets that uh, fail yeah. ultimately. Mm-hmm. Well, and look, there's a an honesty component there that you could uh, analyze for every each and every after the fact picker. Yeah. Like, for example, if Gary was giving his picks after the fact, I would still call him a cheater. But I would also expect Gary to have all the games correct if he picked after the fact. No, I, I'd affect his voodoo sorcery to be about the same. Okay. Yeah. Cheating. Whatever you want to call it. Gary. Well, Rip Dazzled Adam, <laughs> I will send you an email because you can choose from our Lauren Taylor artwork or you can choose a $20 gift card to Flathead Sports and Hobby Cards. And that way, if you have any players that you collect sports cards of, you can talk to Ben and see what he has and, and get those shipped out to you. And if anybody else is looking for sports cards at a great price, you can get your cards of your favorite player sent right to you. And at a great deal, you can reach out to Ben at Flathead Sports and Hobby Cards via Facebook, facebook.com slash FHSH cards. Super cool, man. So, uh, yeah, congratulations to Rip Dazzled Adam. It was a strong bounce back win from Rip Dazzled Adam, though. He only had two picks correct in week two. Well, yeah, because he's an honest picker, unlike Cheating Gary. Mailbag time. If you want to be a part of the mailbag, you can go to seahawkerspodcast.com, click on the contact link, or you can email us at gohawks at seahawkerspodcast.com. William in LA comes in. That is the, the name that I struggled with, with the, with the Will Liam. Oh, oh, that makes a lot more sense now. Yeah. Comes in and says, hey, gentle hawks, William in LA of the Hollywood Seahawks, a bunch of 12s cheering for our Seahawks from a Seahawks bar called Tequila or Tequila on Hollywood Boulevard. There was a little confusion around my name when I got in the flock a couple of weeks ago. My Patreon account is modeled after my music profile, Will Liam Music. Clear that up. Most of my life, I've gone by Will. Hi, Will. I've also not being in the greatest shape most of my life. I was sitting in an ayahuasca ceremony a year or two back. Yes, the psychedelic that Aaron Rodgers made football famous recently. It's life changing. One of my visions I had is that my spirit's name is Will and my body's name is Liam. And mm. I need to take better care of poor Liam. So out of that ceremony, I've gone back to my childhood name, William, as a reminder to myself to take as good a care of my body as I do my mind, emotion, and conscious. It's actually worked for me. Over the last couple of years, I dropped 10 pounds, one and a half percent body fat. I work out several times a week, eat better, I sleep better, and I don't drink so much watching football. That last Winers game, though, sure tested that. <laughs> <laughs> so call me William, normal pronunciation. I root out of Los Angeles, as I mentioned, with my fellow Hollywood Seahawks. We have an awesome group, and a couple of us are little flockers. You guys have done such a great job this season with the extra episodes that I had to support. Love catching you on YouTube, but mostly from Apple Podcasts. I'm most excited, er, 
thrilled this season by Michael Jackson. And man, I can't wait to see what Miles Adams does if they would Catfish. play him. If you're ever in LA on game day, drop in and watch with us at Tequila on Hollywood. It's, pro it's probably Tequila, right? Because it's T-E apostrophe K-I-L-A. And maybe I have a hard time with it because we have Kyla here in Montana. So it's like to Kyla. Maybe. Anyway. I don't know. Uh, There's a lot of hard tell and not knowing there. I, I'm not exactly a pronunciation mastermind, but uh, yeah, I like the way you do it. Stick with it. Roll with it. Have some right. confidence with it. Yeah. And that's from William in LA. If you want to follow him on Twitter, it is A-L-T-I-N Alton J L M B I Z out on Twitter. Yeah, man. Killing it down there in enemy territory. Appreciate you, man. And uh, yeah, interesting experience he had on the old ayahuasca there. Yeah. Yeah. Something Gotta to think take about. care of all the things. Bryson McCartney in via getintheflock.com responding to our idea of a meetup at the Pendleton Roundup says, great idea. A live show from the Triangle, which is, I guess, a camping ground at Pendleton Roundup. I'm in. Letter buck. Letter buck. Uh, sure. Yeah. Now, now we have to do it next year. I'm in. It's a nice time of year to be there. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we do it. We got to rename it the Flocker Roundup then. The Flocker. The, well, it'll forever be known that by everybody who attends, right? Yeah. So is Flocker it a rodeo? Roundup. Is that what? I don't think I don't know. we ever it talked about it. was an hour and the... change away. I never even saw the event. I just happened to suffer the consequences of I'm it. I'm just uh, guessing from Letter Buck if that's a saying I'm that sure it is. is said. Yeah. Unless that's it's world in, famous. Maybe <laughs> it's hay bale stacking. You never know. Yeah. Hey, Bale Origami. If or that's the case, though, Lego. that's way too much work. I would rather watch a rodeo than stack hay bales. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You, Lloydzilla, out on Twitter, comes in. I don't get the anger at Gino. Preseason, I'd have started Drew, but Gino has really impressed me. Has managed the game, been accurate and efficient with passes, and shown why Pete chose him. Who would have known that an experienced and successful head coach would know better than me and a lot of other people? <laughs> hey, yeah, I'd hope that the defense would be better this year. I get the idea of Ben don't break, but at the moment they have more bend than a stretch Armstrong. I think I'd prefer the old break and a bit more rigidity, but not sure that we can do that with our current linebackers. We have been able to stop opposing offenses from getting into scoring position. As I listened to the live reaction show, I realized my full-blown metamorphosis into Adam is nearly complete <laughs> after he described Michael Jackson as up, up, down, up, up. As I watched him, I called him a daisy player because some days he's brilliant and some days he's awful. I like that. That's well put. That's I fun, like that. That's a fun I saying. I like that out of here. Yeah. A daisy yeah. player. And, and, uh, welcome to the dark side, my man. Yeah. This, along with finding myself using once as a mistake, twice as a coincidence, three times a trend, and four times as a you problem in my work, means I am one step away from going off grid. Keep up the awesome work and go Hawks. Hey, go Hawks, man. And uh, fully, fully support the, the off grid situation there. Um, yeah, you and I are very like minded. Uh, just the way that he talked about Gino uh, and all that stuff, just, it, I mean, it's kind of like ditto, bud. We got uh, Barry coming in this week. Washington Commanders fan, Barry. Barry the Commander? Says, hi, Brandon and Adam. Another season has started in an all too familiar way for Washington. The only change this year is that we are the Commanders, clearly in name only. Other being the only team to beat the Jags, the only upside so far is our quarterback isn't out for the season. Carson Wentz isn't a top 10 quarterback, but he's not the biggest problem for us. It's still the defense. A defense which is sprinkled with first round draft picks should be performing so much better. Enough of my Washington misery. It's disappointing not to have tickets for Seattle's game in Munich. John has probably mentioned that we were only 614,458th yeah. place in the queue for tickets. Do you know anyone who managed to get tickets? I was in London a couple weeks ago and popped into the Rocket for a few beers. It was a little quieter than the last time I was there with the Seahawkers for the Raiders game four years ago. Many thanks for the podcast, particularly in the offseason, which keep me entertained. One question, if we combine the wins by Seattle and Washington at the end of the mm. season, would we make the playoffs? Good luck for the rest of the season. Barry the WC. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I guess that means that the commander, like, we'd have to get within two games of being uh, playoff worthy, then, right? Yeah, because that's about how many wins the commanders might get this year. Maybe. Yeah. If you combine the wins, I think the I think the two teams would make the if you combine them. See, you have the two Washingtons. We should be able to combine them. Right. Yeah, they're in D.C. So you think like some act of Congress could make this happen? Yeah. Just pass a law saying that yeah. the two Washingtons combine to to get in the playoffs. Right. They'll be and fun. Kick out some team that nobody wants to watch anyways. Like last year was the Cardinals. Yeah, I'd vote for that. Yeah. Uh, oh, other question Barry asked was, do we know anybody who managed to get tickets? And I think the only people that I, I know for sure went for single tickets and just yeah. got singles and were able to get in that way. Yep. Tough, tough to do this year with, yeah. with that. That was, I don't know that anybody predicted the popularity of that or the popularity of the scalpers uh, with that. Yeah, they crushed it. The scalpers did. Also got the Bard coming in. Hi, fellas. Listen to your shows about the game and can only agree with what you said. So I would be repeating if I went through it again. I'd wish I'd celebrated more when we beat Denver, as it might be our <laughs> season highlight. Fingers crossed. The Bard. P.S. Bloomy is now in country, and I thought Hawk Van Dyke was a bit of a mouthful. It needs to be short and snappy. So how about Dick VD? Just saying. <laughs> yep. You, yep. I'm on board. Yeah. I you like can call that. Call him whatever you want, John. Yeah, absolutely. Man, I, I can't believe the British government uh, allowed this to happen to have Bloomy and John in the same country full time. Like, that, that spells nothing but disaster. Like, there's going to be something terrible that happens. It must have been that. Everybody was still in mourning for the queen or something. And I let this one slip by, but just, this, this is going to be tough. For them. Yeah, yeah. Bloomy knew right when to, to sneak into country. Yeah. Yeah. Sad. But it could be entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. This will be, I think, the last time as we thank our members of the flock at $12 and above at the end of the show. It's going to be the last time we hear yeah. Bloomy as Hong Kong Hawk. And so I, I'm going to be waiting to see. What uh, what we end up changing that to, or yeah. the uh, or as we as we run down our twelve twelvers and Dick you know VD what? has a ring. <laughs> Dick Dick VD has a ring. It, it, look if 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 uh, if Bloomy doesn't get me anything, that's that's what we're gonna have to go with. Right. Yeah. I think he already had thought he had chosen, but uh, John unchose for him, and then rechose. On to do better and better at life. All right, man. Uh, my do better this week is for Seattle Times writer Matt Calkins. I saw this headline pop up on my newsfeed today, and I just just had me shaking my head. Like it, it was one of those things when I read this headline. You know how the quarterback sometimes comes to the line, and I don't know if it's a kill call or they're just trying to settle down the offensive lineman or whatever it is. But they come up to the offensive line, and they're like, "Easy, easy, 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 easy." Yeah. That's that's what was in my head when I read this this headline. Headline: Maybe the Seahawks season isn't over, but it sure is starting to feel that way. Dude, it's week catfish in three. You chill the catfish out. It's a rebuilding year. Number one. Number two. They don't look like a complete dumpster fire. What do you mean the season's over? All the other teams in the NFC West haven't looked like world beaters either, or in the NFC for that matter. The Seahawks season might feel like it's over. You chill the catfish out. I've been hearing a lot of different people already throwing up their hands and be like, it's no use. There's one time I was at this company picnic with my dad as a kid, and uh, the, you had to buy these raffle tickets to like win stuff. And this kid was like five and he was just looking at his dad throughout the entire auction. It's no use. It's no use. He did this for an hour. It was a running joke in my family. Just anytime something go wrong, just, it's no use. That's what Matt Calkin sounds like with that stupid catfish in headline. Easy, 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 easy. Dude, it's week three. The team was at least competitive last week. You don't have like the world's roughest schedule. You're going to have some wins. You might even make a run at maybe making the playoffs. You might have at least an enjoyable competitive season. 
until you draft another quarterback or whatever it is that happens next year. So to Matt Calkins and his doom and gloom crap, do better. I think that ties in nicely with my do better this week as Patrick Doherty out on Twitter at Roto Pat tweeted out after watching the Seahawks game and even in the comments below this verified that he watched the entire 60 minutes. But okay. after the game, this is what his takeaway was. Geno Smith nearing quote, how bad could Drew Locke actually be looking in practice unquote territory after watching that, after watching what we saw from the Seahawks, you thought that Geno Smith was the guy who played so bad, so poorly in that game that the team would actually be considering Drew Locke as the answer. Like you, you watched that whole game against the Falcons and you thought any of the season and any of the season, but mostly if you just watched that one game, if you just watched that one game and your takeaway was man, if they only had drew Locke out there, they could have won that game. Did you not see the defense? Did you not think that maybe they could have run the ball a bit more? Did you not think that maybe some of the dumb penalties that were taken throughout the game at, at key points in the game, you don't think that that had any impact? You think that was Geno Smith? You think it was Geno Smith that caused the Seahawks to lose against the Falcons? Patrick Doherty, if you watch football and that was your takeaway, do better. I want you to go onto his Twitter account. And if there isn't a tweet that reads something along the lines of, I mean, after that performance tonight by Wilson, isn't it time to ask yourself, how bad can Rippon actually be? If he doesn't also have that tweet up there, then he can go catfish himself because honestly, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh, he did have a follow up tweet that said, genuinely cannot believe how many Seahawks fans are tweeting at me that they are satisfied with Geno Smith's quarterback play. So uh, just further doubling down on the, the denial. Yeah. That well, you, doing gotta, you always got to double down a few, yep. even when you're wrong. Well, sounds like he's about as bad at Twitter as he is at watching football. Who is this guy? Uh, this is Patrick Doherty. He's an NFL writer for NBC Sports. Somebody pays him to watch football? Somebody, somebody pays him to watch football. He makes then, a living writing that trash? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, who, who's his boss? Get me in touch. See, credit to uh, Grant G at King of Mock, who said Patrick Doherty nearing, quote, how bad could the NBC Sports newsroom interns actually be <laughs> looking on paper territory? <laughs> Solid response, man. Solid. That, that was my favorite response. Yeah. Although Whitney nailed it here saying, tell me you didn't watch the game without telling me you didn't watch the game. Right. That, that dude gets paid to cover football. That is unfreaking believable, man. Like, I, I, I get maybe, you know, if he's a national writer, it's hard to keep up on everything. But he also said he watched the game. Yeah. It'd be like me watching the last Lions Vikings game and being like, man. How how bad is could Jared Goff's backup possibly be? Like Goff doesn't look amazing, but he didn't look terrible at all. Right, like he was doing Goff things. Yeah, it's like, fine. Yeah, it was fine. Again, we're not saying Geno Smith is awesome and is the second coming of Rich Gannon. Right, but unless he is, unless he is, I don't know. He's, I mean, he's again, on second I, coming of Rich Gannon. Watch. I mean, I think we're entering the territory of has Gino done enough watch? Yeah. Give it, give it, give me a little bit more time on like that. Week seven. If he's still playing like this, like week seven, I'll, I'll, I'm just, I'll be satisfied. That's, that's all. I'm okay. I'm just saying it's going to, it might have to be a, a weekly topic. Well, how about we move on to better at life? My better at life this week for all of those hurricane weather reporters down there who are out there on the front lines <laughs> and being out in the hurricane weather uh, to show us just how bad weather can be. Now I, I have to give it to them because I think it's asinine that whoever their bosses are like, we can't just set something up in really bad weather to show how bad it can be without putting like an actual human in danger. This is the thing that I don't understand, Adam. If it's so bad Doesn't that we want people to evacuate, but right. then we have a, a news guy out there telling us how he has a four-year-old at home and he's explaining it to his kid like it's 
rolling the windows down and you're going through a car wash. Um, hey, thanks, that- Jim. Just standing here on the sidewalk and my hair just blew off. I think that maybe the rain has turned into nails. I don't know what else to do. Tell my son I love him. Jim Acosta out. Peace. <laughs> like, this is the Stay safe. Thing. Stay safe, Jim. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I, I yes, I, I don't understand why we have to put these people at risk, but they have a job to do. They're going out and doing it and they're they're doing it without complaining. And so, yes, to Jim Acosta and all the other news people who are doing this, despite yeah. the smart thing to do better at life than Skip Bayless. Yeah, I think Jim Acosta is one of the like White House reporters or something like that. So I doubt, I doubt he's pulled hurricane beach duty. Uh, no? like some of these other, no, poor he, didn't, bastards. he didn't come off the white house beat to, to go down to no, Florida. Probably not. Probably not. Oh, yeah. Okay. He probably, he probably would have accused the hurricane of being liberal or conservative or something. And then like, yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm thinking it's another, there. another gym that, uh, that's down. Yeah. There. Yeah. Probably a different Jim, but oh, hey, Jim Cantori. Uh, that's the weather Cantori, channel guy. That's who it is. Yeah. I knew that Jim, Jim rang a bell, but uh, yeah, I don't understand this at all. Like I don't need a dude standing out there being like, yeah, it's really windy. He got hit by a tree branch covering the <laughs> hurricane down there. Like how badly does a dude have to get hurt doing this before we say, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't do it. And I saw, I saw a reporter actually trying to justify it saying, well, we have to show the people who left the reason, you know, all the dangerous things that they're not seeing yeah. because they left. It's like, again, you can set up cameras and have yeah. people not there to where you can exactly. see destruction on camera. Yeah. From street cam or get one of those Boston Dynamics creepy ass robot dogs and throw a camera on top of it and try his ass around. That, we we don't need to be the, angering the robots any more than we already have. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, we should keep our uh, eventual future overlords happy. No doubt about it. But uh, no, I don't understand. That. And then uh, uh, not only that, like, why is this the only natural disaster that we like send reporters into? Like if it's a wildfire, like they're standing away from the wildfire. Right. Like, it's not like when an earthquake starts going off, like they flick on the camera, like I'm in the earthquake and I won't be Like you don't see that. No. Like we, we, I don't. No tornadoes. I don't we don't. We don't send reporters into tornadoes. Right. Yeah. You know, some reporter being like, you know, toilet bowled in a freaking tornado. Being so like, I mean, we it got sends cows. the wrong message. If you want people to evacuate these places, yeah, don't have somebody on TV standing there making it look fun. Yeah, exactly. And then getting some glory for it. It's very right. weird. Hurricane, weird. the whole hurricane phenomenon is very weird to me that anybody is a hurricane victim. It's because you just, you don't listen. That That's the problem. You just don't listen. Hey, you got five days before this natural disaster is going to hit you. What you going to do? I, I don't know. It'll probably go around, I guess. <laughs> I just... Doesn't make any sense. Oh my God, I don't have a house no more and I'm about dead. Well, you Who can't saw move your that house. coming? Can't move. Yeah. Your house is generally stationary. If only I'd listened to that gym, I'd have been all right. But now I got a branch through my chest. Oh boy. <laughs> I just don't understand people who can't get out of the way of a hurricane. It's, it's not that hard. Of all the disasters, it's one that I feel like you have more time to and, move on yeah. from. It, it, unless you're on an island and you don't have a lot of money, that that could get tough. Yeah. But if you're on the mainland, I don't want to hear I don't have enough money to get out of here. Start walking, yo. You can make it a long ways in five days. And I'm sure somebody, you can hitchhike with somebody. I feel like there's enough cars going out of town. You can probably pull right. together. Hey, man, why are you walking? Um, Hurricane. I'm trying to get away. Oh, sweet. Hop, Hop in. in. Yeah. And I feel like you're generally... You know, they say don't pick up strangers. Yeah. But when I worked up at the ski mountain and you saw somebody walking alongside the road yeah. with a pair of skis or a snowboard, you kind of knew where they're going. Yeah. And knew that they were okay. Yeah. It's a lot like um, summertime along the Clark Fork River here in uh, Montana when you see somebody walking along the road with a tube over top of their shoulder. They probably just need a shuttle ride to yeah. you know, back to their rig or to the point that they're putting in. 
Uh, you know what they're up to. It's not a it's not a secret. Help some people out. Help some people out. Take a risk. Who's your better at life? My better at life this week, Brandon. It's for NASA because they s- crashed a spacecraft this week. They smashed it. <laughs> they smashed it. They smashed it, man. And I think it's awesome. It's really fun because it was an intentional smash. Mm. And it's something that we need because the spacecraft that they had crashed was called the DART mission, which is short for, hold on now. I had it here. Whatever. It don't make no, never mind. <laughs> it, it's short for smash a spacecraft into an asteroid and see if you can get it to go away from us a little faster in case one's flying right at Earth. I'm glad that they're taking some time to put into this. What happens if we don't have Bruce Willis or Ben Affleck around to get rid of a dangerous asteroid? NASA's testing this Catfish. out right now. And they sent the DART mission out and smashed it into this uh, asteroid that wasn't going to hit Earth, but they just they needed a test subject. Sure. It was pretty cool. They crashed the spacecraft on purpose. Now, over the next uh, three, four months, we get to find out whether or not it worked. Did it push it? Did it move its orbit? Did it change it? And they think it was. They hit the thing at like 14,000 miles an hour. See, my biggest concern with missions like this, though, yeah, is that an asteroid like this, like it has to be big enough. An asteroid that's, um, you want to test it out on an appropriately sized asteroid, right? Right. One that's going to cause enough destruction that you would need to. Like a, a city killer or up. So, yeah, my my one concern, though, is that now we push the asteroid uh, enough to where it ends up impacting the Earth a thousand years later. I mean, or maybe you push it into like Mars or some other crap. And then by then, like people are living there. Uh, See, there's unintended consequences. It's like when the Forest Service put the shrimp in Flathead Lake to help the salmon. But then they ate all the food that the salmon ate. And then there were no more salmon. See, Sometimes you can't see all the things. But we do have some members of the flock who had the foresight to support the show at $12 and above. And we want to make sure that we regularly thank you and call you out. And let's run down the list. Keith Kedover, a.k.a. Flocktimus Prime, University of Cybertron, Little Flockers, roll out. DCH from Sparks, Nevada. The University of Montana Grizzlies. Eric Trench, rooting for the Seahawks out of Renton, Washington. Graduated from Eastern Washington University. Jameson Holman from Murray, Utah. Representing Mississippi State University. Hail State and go Hawks. Gary Blum from Chappaqua, New York and the University of Pennsylvania. Your 2016 Pick'em League champion. Ron Pepper, UNLV Running Rebels, San Francisco, California. Ella Esparza, Woodway, Texas. Yale University and Sam Houston State eat em up cats. Lisa in Seattle. Samuel Gelber, NoHo, California. David Van Cleve, Camus, Washington, home of the papermakers. Leo Jose, Ludio, Sweden, from Ludio Eskimos and Van Coma in front. Paul from San Diego. Aaron Fisher, aka Lock It and Put It in Your Pocket, Las Vegas, Nevada. Chris Boucher, a.k.a. The Biggest Little Flocker, South Central Louisiana State University. Go Mud Dogs. Hey, Seahawkers. My name is Garen Taylor. I live in one of the most beautiful places in the world, North Idaho. Hashtag on the roads. Go Hawks. And for one last time. Hong Kong! Hawks! Hong Kong! Hawks! Hong Kong! Hawks! And continuing on down the list, starting with executive producers Brian Shaw, Dustin Mock, and Rebecca Christensen. We've also got Christina in Manassas, Craig in Camus, Roe in Federal Way, James in Linwood, Sven in Berlin, Deutschland, Jake in Seattle, Jeremiah in the Bronx, Young in Anchorage, Tim in Austin, Christian in Oslo, Norway, Kathy in Eureka, California, Jonathan in Ridgefield, JC in Horsford, England, Brandon in Huntersville, North Carolina. James in Bow Arts. Kevin in Onaway, Idaho. Jay in Linwood. Jeffrey in Kansas City. Kari in Rochester. Glenn in Ocoee, Florida. Brian in Berlin, Connecticut. Connie in Gothenburg, Sweden. Tracy in Kaneohe, Hawaii. Taylor in South Cleelum. Ewolf in Seattle. Kevin in Surrey, BC. 
Marvin in Riverdale, Utah, Dean in the Greater Hockdom, John C. in the Greater Hockdom, John W. in New York, Patrick in Sacramento, Bryson in Eltopia, Jeremy in Federal Way, Josh in Cander, New York, Ken in Hutto, Texas, Lobster in Clovis, California, Mario in Seattle, Cora in Ditters, Deutschland, Brian in Omak, Anders in Byla, Denmark, Jeff in Bainbridge Island, Warren in Dundee, Oregon, Chris in Austin, Amy in Squim, Preston in Phoenix, Dr. G in League City, Texas, Richard in Killeen, Texas, Joseph in Vancouver, Ivy in Renton, Kevin in Great Glen, England, Corey in Ridgefield, Kyle in the Greater Hockdom, Ryan in Salt Lake City, Joshua in the Greater Hockdom, Norma in the Greater Hockdom, Rafe in Beaverton, Oregon, Janie in Oswestry, England, Chris in Billings, DJ in Menifee, California, Tim in Olympia, Jason in Panama City, Florida, Terrence in Seattle, Eugene in Henderson, Nevada, Daniel in Post Falls, Idaho, Marlon in the Greater Hockdom, Chad in Lexington Park, Maryland, Bridget in Redmond, Ryan in Crestview, Florida, Jerv in Bristow, Virginia, Spooty Poo in Olympia, Kayla in Vancouver, Tanner in Kalispell, Montana, Dan in the Greater Hockdom, Ryan in Fairbanks, Nate in Solna, Sweden, Jason in Portland, Sean in Cascade, Iowa via Kalispell, Montana, Johnny D in Silverton, Oregon, Julio in Mililani, Hawaii, Leland in South Jordan, Utah, Bibi in Oakland, Jeff in Gilbert, Arizona, Gordon in Whitefish, Montana, Ovary Smasher 69 in Phoenix, Corey in Robertson, Australia, Daniel in the Greater Hockdom, B Walls 22 in New York, Russell in Harpenden, England, Jay in Fairbanks, Sam in Altamonte Springs, Florida, Chris in Manchester, England, Logan in Evansville, Indiana, Stephen in Irvine, Mark in La Mirada, California, Adrian in Squim, Jonathan in New Market, England, John in East Kilbride, England, William in Los Angeles, David in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and lastly, Ranger Luke in Olathe, Kansas. So big thanks once again to all of our members of the flock at $12 and above. Yes, thank you so much for helping keep this crazy thing going, especially now. Yeah, man. Those people are heroes. They're the real reason all this happens. And I uh, can't thank you enough, man. Giving me at least a little bit of confidence as the first of the year comes up here. And I get ready to depart from being a dirty grind. That's all we want. We want Adam to not have to be... A dirty, dirty grinder. Dirty. And I think with that, there's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.